With Fairy Tale 100 Year Quest finally being animated and us once again following the adventures of Team Natsu, there's a lot going on in the world of Fairy Tale, in particular as we meet the fifth generation of Dragon Slayers, which is why in today's newest Anime Explained video, we're going to be taking a look at every Dragon Slayer in the world of Fairy Tale from the first generation all the way to the fifth generation of Dragon Slayers. As always, parts of this video will contain some spoilers, but we'll keep the spoilers limited to what you only absolutely need to know about the characters so consider yourself warned. So as we all know dragon slayers are individuals in the fairy tale world who possess the lost magic that is known as dragon slayer magic. Currently there are almost 40 different types of dragon slayer magic which we'll cover in depth in a whole nother video though we will explain the magic types as they become relevant in this video but we'll keep it brief. Dragon slayers each have their own form of magic the same way that each dragon has their own magic element. For example Igneal uses fire magic and so too does Natsu. On top of that dragon slayers can consume the element that they use so long as it's not created by their own magic by doing this they can be rejuvenated and get an additional boost to their abilities dragon slayers each have amped up senses way stronger than normal humans from smell to hearing and if they manage to kill a dragon and bathe in their blood then they get even stronger as a result as we see with agnologia who ended up bathing in the blood of dragons and even transforming into a dragon himself there are other things that dragon slayers can do also those who do transform in the dragons they can return to the human form though as we see with irene not all of these people have the ability to figure it out right then and there how to switch back to a human form as quickly as others as you expect dragon slayer magic with all its immense power also comes with its own drawbacks mainly the motion sickness that affects all dragon slayers for the most part though the fifth generation haven't been shown with this issue traveling by vehicle isn't impossible for dragon slayers though they might have to tough it out like how natsu has to do several times in the series or they have to have a vehicle that's specially made for them to travel on. Before we go into each individual Dragon Slayer, let's look at what makes each generation different. So the first generation are Dragon Slayers who learned the Dragon Slayer magic from actual dragons, with the dragons being their foster parent, like we see with Natsu who learned under Igneal. The second generation of Dragon Slayers are people who have Dragon Lacrima that is implanted into their bodies, which allows them to use Dragon Slayer magic. They, of course, were not taught directly by dragons. The third generation, generation of dragon slayers are different from the first two because they were both taught dragon slayer magic by real dragons and they have their bodies implanted with dragon lacrima the fourth generation of dragon slayers are artificial beings that are made from dragon lacrima and they are capable of fighting until their power is destroyed the fifth generation of dragon slayers they are the hands down the most hardcore so basically they get their powers by eating the dragon flesh or cannibalism of other dragon slayers which allows them to gain the magic power of the flesh that they devour that's why you'll often hear this generation being referred to as being dragon eaters. So now that we got the dragon slayer magic out of the way and how the various generations work, let's go into detail for each of the dragon slayers of every generation. Let's start things off with the series protagonist Natsu Dragneel, who uses fire dragon slayer magic, which was taught to him by the dragon Igneal. As the younger brother of Zeref, who died 400 years ago, he was revived as END, and Natsu, like a few other dragon slayers, were sent from 400 years into the future with the intention to defeat Agnologia. Natsu, he can be hot tempered, he can be reckless, he can be carefree, yet despite him being so quick to throw hands with his guildmates and throw out the occasional insult, Natsu is fiercely loyal to those who he calls his friends and he doesn't take too kindly to people who make life hell for the people who are near and dear to his heart. Natsu is just as immature as he is powerful, which as one of the strongest wizards alive, that is saying a lot. Anyone who is in his vicinity is liable to have a hilarious prank that's pulled on them. It's because of how childish he is that he is both someone who is allowed to have a rather unorthodox fighting style when he's ridden in the fight, and it also leads to his enemies grossly underestimating him, which that is much to their downfall in the end. As we see throughout the series multiple times, Natsu is always determined to prove himself and to grow stronger. We see him at times challenging powerful wizards like the guild master Makarov, and when he wasn't doing that, he was trying to throw down with all the S class mages in fairy tale from the lovely but demonic mirror jane the hot tempered and deadly urza the brash and powerful loxus and even challenging guild arts despite his reputation for being as powerful as he is natsu is never one to back down from a fight and always looking to self-improve as he chases those who he knows are more powerful than him it's through these battles that natsu doesn't just test his power but as he fights the various enemies that he does we see that his fights they aren't just him winging it but he's also 
also got an underrated level of genius to the strategy and that his actions are so simple they're actually brilliant it's because of how black and white he tends to see things at times like the innocence of a child that he values lives of those we calls comrades uplifting them when they need to be supported and stopping them when they're about to throw their lives away in order to sacrifice themselves those who are fortunate enough to have a soft spot in natsu's giant heart are likely to have been saved at one point or another where they've been placed in a situation where natsu has saved them from themselves with all the members of team natsu being a prime example of this at various points in the series in more than one way he's either directly or just through his presence natsu has saved each of the members of team fairy tale the dynamic is probably best seen with say natsu and lucy which that runs deeper than a lot of people give credit for it's more than natsu and lucy just being this pairing or natsu saving lucy because she was a damsel in distress early on but instead it has a lot to do with her scent being very similar to anna hartfilia who was both lucy's direct ancestor as well as the person who looked after natsu when he was a child there's a strong attachment to lucy when it comes to natsu and we see it at times come out where he's very fiercely protective of her like we see when he sees a version of future lucy die with his fire dragon slayer magic natsu has multiple methods of combat at his disposal because he's super crafty when he uses it which that goes back to his unorthodox fighting style like other dragon slayers when he eats the element that he's compatible with he can get a severe boost when he eats fire the heat from his fire is directly tied to both his magic as well as his emotions so at times you can see natsu and he's saying he's all fired up that isn't some just wonky catchphrase it is literally natsu powering up as the battle is going on due to natsu's natural body heat being so insane he's super resistant to cold weather that would make a normal person like say lucy complain like we see early on in volume one of fairy tales manga by adding the flame to his attacks natsu's punches and kicks they hit home that much harder as a result and what makes him so dangerous is that natsu can generate the flames from any part of his body due to the fact that he can eat fire in any form it makes things like explosions utterly useless against him and we've seen him shoot fire out of his lungs so strong that it burns metal completely what's also interesting is that natsu has grown more proficient in his dragon slayer magic and as the time's gone on he's been able to control the shape of it manipulate the trajectory of his attacks and his body heat is so high that later on he has shown melting bladed weapons when they come into contact with the skin also natsu possesses remnants of the flames of the fire types that he's consumed in the past so igneous fire the flames of igneous sun ignea and atlas flame while you're probably familiar with his fire dragon's roar which is natsu releasing this enormous swath of fire from his mouth and is shot out as a continuous stream of fire you're probably more interested in his different fire dragon modes natsu obviously has a lot of them lightning fire dragon mode comes from natsu eating the flames of loxus and so the flames and lightning they are mixed together and this results in natsu getting a pretty boost in power as a result over time due to his second origin natsu can use this power at will without strain as we saw previously his black fire dragon mode comes from absorbing the flames of dark regulus which natsu combines those flames with his own which amps up his destructive output on his own attacks but at first natsu did have a nasty fever due to the dark magic within the flames his fire dragon king mode came after 10 months of training where natsu finally learned to use the power that igneo gave him when natsu got this power he believed it was enough to take down xerif and even after igneo's power is gone natsu can still use this mode but it isn't as strong as it would have normally been when he uses this mode the water in the area it basically evaporates and when you add in natsu's intense emotions things heat up quite literally super fast using this power natsu overpowered xerif in his fairy heart form natsu also has a standalone lightning dragon mode which he unlocked when he briefly lost his fire dragon slayer magic and when he uses this mode as a standalone he gains the lightning bolt scar that belonged to loxus natsu also has dragon force which allows natsu to enter into the most powerful state that a dragon slayer can unlock where he's using the very power that is very comparable to the strength of a real dragon when using this power natsu gets scales all over his body when natsu uses this power the power that we see is good enough that we see him holding off god c alderaan one of the five dragon gods of fairy tale hunting your quest with attacks that are so strong they are directly scaled to being like that of a real dragon natsu is a byproduct of using dragon slayer magic does have dragonization which natsu has antibodies in his body to prevent from turning into a full-on dragon natsu is able to achieve a partial transformation like growing wings on the left side of his body for increased speed when he 
Disney flies. Next up, we have the mother of Dragon Slayers herself, Irene, who is also the mother of Urza Scarlet. Irene is the strongest woman in the Spriggan 12. She is once known as the Scarlet Despair due to her immense power. She is also the mother of Dragon Slayer magic, and though she is dead after the events of the Alvarez War, there are parts of Fairy Tale 100 Year Quest where she does become super relevant, which I won't touch on those because of how big of a spoiler those things are, especially when we get to the character of Selene when she's introduced. Irene uses Sage Dragon Slayer magic, which as we've seen allows for the amplification of magic, magic power, and enchantments. Irene is as smart as she is curvy and powerful. Like Natsu, she is very protective of those in her care, referring to her subordinates as her children, and when she battles Mira Jane after she defeats them, she makes Mira Jane pay for it with a pretty intense bout of torture. Irene, as you saw in the final arc of Fairy Tales original series, she has a cruel streak to her, not above transforming a daughter into a mouse right in front of her father, and when she tortures Mira Jane, she takes delight in making her suffer. She isn't above being overly blunt. Even at times, she can approach someone like Zareph with a very bold critique on her part. As admirable of a quality as that is, it can rub some people the wrong way due to how brutally honest she can be. However, she wasn't always like this. So Irene, 400 years ago, didn't used to be called the Scarlet Despair, but instead she was known as the Scarlet Angel. She pushed for ways to protect her country, even entering into a political marriage and wanted to find a way for humans and dragons to coexist. She created Dragon Slayer magic with the intention to create coexistence between the two sides, but once the dragon that she was attached to was killed by Agnologia, it drove her into despair, and this is where her life got super cruel. Due to her undergoing dragonization, she was placed into a jail, and she forcibly halted the growth of her daughter that was growing inside of her stomach during that time, with all of the desperate motherly urges that she had to protect her unborn daughter. This eventually drove Irene into madness, where she became obsessed with wanting to return back to her human form, at one point trying to enchant herself on the fetus of her unborn child, and she eventually abandons her daughter after it's born, or rather, that is what we were initially led to believe. The truth is, is that Irene did not want to do any harm to her daughter, so she abandoned her for her own good. Much like how Asta from Black Clover was abandoned by his mother for a similar reason, this ultimately is what makes the moment where Irene kills herself in the battle with Urza so poetic and so heartbreaking. Irene is known for her enchantment magic, which allows her to change people, objects, and the landscape, even the atmosphere itself as she sees fit. She gets really high praise from someone like Zareph, who referred to her as being a basic prodigy with this magic, and she is able to outright detach magic from people like she does when she detaches Fairy Heart from Mavis, something that should have been impossible to do, but she is also able to accomplish this feat when she's given enough time. We've seen her use personality enchantment to transfer her own personality to people like Wendy and to give life to weapons like swords. She can use eye magic to view events and people from long distances by summoning a giant eye in the sky, which allows her to see whatever she focuses in on when the magic is active. When she enters into her dragon form, she's extremely powerful. Being able to crush people outright to death, she can raise her magic power to levels so insane, and she can also summon a giant asteroid to come crashing down onto the earth. Next up, we have Elisaria, a new character who we meet in Fairy Tale 100 Year Quest. He is the first person to ever have the title of being a guild master and the founder of Magia Dragon. As you saw in episode one of the anime, he joins that very long list of tried and tested, perverted, dirty old men anime characters like Master Roshi from Dragon Ball and Jiraiya from Naruto, shown when he shows a rather funny fascination with Lucy's rather large cleavage being shown in her new outfit for the series. His story, it is a tragic one. Having seen multiple mages killed in his lifetime and after learning Dragon Slayer magic so that he could fight against the dragons, he finds himself as a result eventually transformed into a dragon. After a long period of time, he is eventually relenting in his battle against the dragon gods. Instead, he sends out requests to guilds for the chance for them to take the dragon gods down, which that is what ultimately birthed the 100 year quest, which has gone unfulfilled for a whole century. With very powerful mages like Gildarts failing and Gildarts being the only one who returned home from the quest alive, which speaks volumes to the difficulty of the quest. It's for this reason he lost hope that anyone would be able to complete the quest and that's why he's shown smiling at the prospect of Natsu and the fairy tale mages being able to do so because of their confidence. He uses both Law Dragon Slayer magic as well as teleportation magic. Law Dragon Slayer magic allows him to possess the information of all the knowledge in the magic world which surpasses even the most informed bookworms of the modern era due to how extensive his knowledge is. Like Agnologia and Irene, he can shift between 
between his dragon form and his human form. After his heart is devoured by Dogramog, he made a replacement organ for his heart and he can still feel his heart beating off in the distance. Next up we have Gajio, the former S-Class mage of Phantom Lord and the current member of the Fairy Tale Guild. This literal proud papa is incredibly powerful and like Natsu, he came from 400 years ago in the past. He used to be a hothead, he used to be cold blooded and rough around the edges but over time with the members of Fairy Tale, in particular the mother of his child Levi, it has caused him to soften as Gajio has experienced love from the Fairy Tale Guild. However, one thing that has never changed about Gajio is that when he is loyal to someone or something, this guy is super, super loyal, in particular to the guild that he pledges his allegiance to. That loyalty to his comrades, it serves him well, except for when the guy decides to become a musician, then at that point the loyalty is a one-way street because he's delusional enough to think he's a good musician. Even though he and Natsu, they are comrades now, they do have a bit of an open rivalry, which has led to some rather funny scenes throughout their time together, like my personal favorite moment being when Natsu does this man dirty during the Grand Magic Games when they're fighting against Sting and Rogue. Their dynamic is one that works due to how well the two of them play off of each other, despite both of them being hot-tempered at times and coming across like bickering brothers. Dajil uses Iron Dragon Slayer magic, which was taught to him by the Iron Dragon. This allows him to use iron manipulation. Like Natsu can eat fire to regain his strength, Gajio can do the same when he consumes iron. Oftentimes, you'll see him using magic to make these iron rods and change parts of his body to steel. Like his rival Natsu, Gajio has more than one form. So for Gajio, for example, he possesses the Iron Shadow Dragon Mode. When he got that from eating some of Rogue Shadows, which allows him to use both the shadows and his Iron Dragon Slayer magic, which allows him to turn his body into a shadow to become intangible. He also possesses Dragon Force, which gives him a monster amp and power. Next up, we have Agnologia himself, the Dragon King and the antagonist of the final arc of Fairy Tale and the Boogeyman for the five Dragon Gods in Fairy Tale Hunter Your Quest. Centuries ago, his life was changed when dragons killed his family and destroyed his city, which sent him down a path of killing dragons because he was of the belief they were an abomination of nature who only brought the world destruction and despair. His Dragon Slayer magic is time magic, and during his rampage, he was bloodthirsty and didn't discriminate when it came to dragons. If it had wings and it was a dragon, he was killing it. In the present era, Agnologia mostly kept to himself, viewing himself as being above humans, having the power to rule the world, but having none of the aspiration to do so. However, when he does decide to let loose, just in his human form, we've seen him unleash ungodly levels of power, and as Zareth theorizes, Agnologia is truly waiting for someone worthy enough to bring him out the corners of the world to engage in battle due to his love for battle itself. This ultimately leads to him battling people like God, Serena, and Irene. Not many who cross paths with Agnologia are fortunate enough to survive like Guild Arts, and it's for good reason. Only Guild Arts at that point in the story was the only human who survived an encounter with them, and that's only because Agnologia left him for dead. As one of the very first Dragon Slayers to ever exist, he is rightfully overpowered, and over time, after bathing in the blood of countless dragons and even turned into a dragon himself, he gained the ability to consume any magic type to replenish himself in battle, making him hard to deal with by conventional means. However, even he has his limits, with a rather controversial ending to the manga where everyone need to pull their power together, every mage on the continent in order to take him down. This is understandable when just his dragon war and his dragon form was enough to wipe out Tenryu Island. His time magic allowed him to warp dragon slayers to a pocket dimension of his own where his spirit resides while his body wrecks havoc on the world on the real world. As we see in the series, he can battle off multiple powerful characters like Mira Jane and Urza and Gajiel and fight off all the dragon slayers on his own. Just his human form was enough to easily slay powerful characters like God Serena without much effort. He's also super fast being shown blitzing characters in just his human form. Just being in his presence is enough to make even the strongest mages start sweating in nerves with the belief being that only Zareph using Fairy Heart had a chance to stand up against him. Now Wendy will round off the last of the first generation of Dragon Slayer. Wendy uses Sky Dragon magic and she is one of the youngest Dragon Slayers that we'll meet on this list. Wendy uses Sky Dragon magic. Wendy is super shy. She is very polite and she is soft spoken but she's also shown flashes of high level intelligence at times though she can come off a bit ditzy every now and then. She's super loyal to the guild but she can also be insecure when it comes to her appearance which that can be understanding when you think about somebody who is not above getting her hands dirty in order to protect those she loves. Her Sky Dragon magic allows her to freely manipulate the air. This power also allows her to heal others which makes her come in handy during a battle in a support role. Her magic is a jack of all trades in that she is able to use her magic to amp up the speed and attacks of herself as well as her comrades which makes her come in pretty clutch when Urza is in that battle with Irene and as we see in Fairy Tale Hunter Your Quest in one 
one of Urza's fights, she is able to assist Urza with her enchantments. Wendy is also by default a really good navigator because her magic allows her to sense the air currents, which lets her predict the weather. Wendy also has Dragon Force, which gives her a super boost in power, but her Dragon Force causes a physical transformation where her eyes and her hair change to color pink and she has her hair growing length. Her sensory abilities go up in that she can hear the voice of the wind and the heartbeat of the atmosphere and she can control the air around her. Wendy in this form is not only much faster, which for someone as small as her, that makes her deadly, but she is also incredibly powerful as well. Wendy can also undergo a partial dragification where she's able to produce small wings on her back. Now we'll move on to the second generation of Dragon Slayers and we're going to start things off with Loxus himself, the leader of the Thunder God tribe and the grandson of the current fairy tale guild master. Loxus uses lightning magic and lightning dragon slayer magic. When we first meet him, Loxus is brash, he is arrogant, he comes across as someone who believes that might makes right and for a time he was driven to prove himself to Makarov to make others acknowledge him for his power and not as being the grandson of mighty Makarov. He's very unlikable when we first meet him with the way that he makes fun of those who are weaker than him but over time we see that Loxus has grown very protective of his guildmates regardless as if they're weaker than him or not. He's come a long way from the guy who only saw Lucy in that she had value because she had big breasts and he wanted to make her a girlfriend and the guy would only come out to get involved in the Phantom Lord battle only if Lucy agreed to be his girlfriend and if Kana agreed to strip in front of him. The time he spent away from Fairy Tail is responsible for a bulk of the change in his character and now it has him as a clear favorite to replace Makarov as the next guild master when that time eventually comes. Originally his magic was lightning magic which lets him use lightning at will to shock people by making electrical discharges which allows him to fight both from a distance as well as in close quarters combat. He's able to melt iron with his lightning, discharge lightning from his body and can randomly target his enemy with lightning strikes when they least expect it. He can also in a very crafty way use lightning to blind his enemies. He is also able to turn his entire body into lightning if it calls for. In terms of power he has grown powerful enough that on his own he can fight off powerful members of the Spreegan 12 depending on who it is with just his lightning magic and the attacks like Thunder Palace can do wide scale damage and destroy a town if it's set up properly. When he uses his lightning form he can turn his body into lightning which allows him to move at super fast speeds to get the upper hand while making his body transparent at times to force attacks in order to pass through him and he moves at such fast speeds and he covers such vast distances in mere seconds that it almost appears as if he's teleporting. However his lightning dragon slayer magic is what makes him one of the deadliest characters on this list. He can regain his strength by eating lightning and everything about his lightning magic is amped up by several times. This makes attacks from his lightning dragon's roar so dangerous because someone already this powerful when he really lets loose can destroy everything in front of him and he's able to perform his lightning dragon's roar faster than other dragon slayers who use their own dragon roars. Like Natsu and Gajio, he also has a form which is the red lightning dragon mode. This allows him to use the power of the red lightning dragon, a power that goes beyond normal lightning. It's formidable enough that even someone like Urza has trouble when she fights Loxus. He also has the lightning dragon king mode which further amps up his power levels and he can use it in conjunction Junction with his red lightning dragon mode. Loxus also has dragon force which is another boost in power. On top of being able to use thought projection to make a projection of himself from over long distances he can also use fairy law one of fairy tales three great magics which is highly destructive to anyone who is considered an enemy to the caster. We now move on to Eric the guy who uses poison dragon slayer magic who also goes by the name of Cobra and is a former member of the Rashion Sace. Like Loxus when we first see him he is arrogant and and he gets off on seeing other people suffer and he's got a huge superiority complex believing himself superior to all the first generation dragon slayers. However after we meet him and the story progresses he does mellow out but he is still prone to bouts of anger and hostility which makes sense. This guy did used to be a slave. I'd have a little bit of pent up anger and aggression as well as would anyone else in that situation. He uses poison dragon slayer magic which allows him to produce poison from his body and consume poison to heal and strengthen himself with one benefit being the the guy is obviously immune to poison. When he produces poison from his skin, it acts as a corrosive that decays everything that it touches. When he uses his poison dragon roar, he can shoot off a roar of poison that injects a virus into his targets that can weaken them and slowly kill them over time. He also has hearing magic, which allows him to hear the soul of a person to sense their emotions, but it can also serve as a pseudo form of precognition because he's able to predict what they're about to do before they do it. It is potent enough.
enough that those who first encounter it, they are confusing it with mind reading. His sound magic allows him to sacrifice the eyesight of his right eye, but in exchange, he can make violent sound waves of peer pressure, which serve both as a defense as well as an overwhelming offense that can cause mass destruction. He can also dragonize his arms into claws of the poison dragon. Next up, we have God Serena, the last of the second generation dragon slayers, and is easily the most broken out of all of them. He was formerly one of the 10 wizard saints and ranked first amongst all the gods of Ishgar and is a member of the Spreegan 12. Like Irene, you'll be seeing him in Fairy Tale Hunter Your Quest, but again, we won't go into how and why to avoid a massive spoiler. As for his magic, he possesses several different types of magic, a grand total of eight different magic types, which we'll touch on in a moment. So God Serena is just over the top. He is flamboyant, and as a result, Makarov isn't necessarily his biggest fan. He's a guy who literally loves the spotlight and he craves it. Being over dramatic when he's holding conversations, he, for lack of better words, is not to be confused with someone who is lacking in confidence. When he crushes his enemy, the guy is not above trash talking to prove his superiority even further. He is powerful, and like you would expect, that power does make him arrogant in the eyes of some people. As we see when he's confronted by the former saints, he's got a severe mean streak to him, and when he uses his dragon slayer magic, he is quick to crush those who stand in his way. To the point, one could argue it's almost enough to call him bloodlusted. He isn't above seeking out a challenge either. His whole reason to defect to the Alvarez Empire was a chance to hunt down and slay Agnologia. He can of course use eight different types of dragon slayer magic ranging from fire, water, wind, earth, lightning, diamond light, and darkness. He's a master of dragon lacrima and that's why he is referred to as the eight dragon god Serena. It's for this reason he is easily one of the most versatile fighters we have in this series because he can attack with multiple dragon slayer elements at the same time making it very hard for someone to battle against him. He can even use all eight elements simultaneously to become a true force of nature. Lightning Dragon Slayer magic allows him to control lightning, whereas Cavern Dragon Slayer magic gives him the ability to control earth by altering the landscape. Purgatory Dragon Slayer magic allows him to use extreme levels of heat by making insane levels of power and attacks that are comparable to the Fire Dragon's Iron Fist. Sea King Dragon Slayer magic allows him free reign over water, where he can make high pressure torrents of water out of his palm. Gale Dragon Slayer magic allows him to make whirlwinds around his fists. Diamond Dragon Slayer magic allows him to make a hardened fist of diamonds or make a suit of armor out of diamonds, amping up both his offense and defense. Spark Dragon Slayer magic allows him to manipulate light. Darkness Dragon Slayer magic allows him to use darkness as a way to put his enemies in enormous pain that makes them atone for their sins through the pain as they are feeling their flesh destroyed. Now, the first of the third generation Dragon Slayers is going to be Rogue. Rogue was sent from 400 years in the past with the intention to have him assist in the destruction of Agnologia. He uses Shadow Dragon Slayer magic. When we first meet him, he comes across as super calm. He doesn't showcase too much emotion, but that changes when he gets around Gajil. We see that unlike his former guild master Sabretooth, he isn't willing to humiliate others. Like when he sees Yukino lose our match against Kagura. When Minerva was torturing Lucy, he was one of the few who did not appear to find joy in the sadistic behavior that he was witnessing. But as we all remember, in the Grand Magic games, even someone as kind-hearted as him can be turned into a villain under the right circumstances like when we see future Rogue. As a huge fan and admirer of Gajil, his character arc is just as enjoyable to see, particularly when you see how he was able to avoid the fate of future Rogue. His Shadow Dragon Slayer magic allows him to transform his body into that of a shadow, which makes it really hard for him to be touched through normal conventional means. This makes him incredibly difficult to deal with in battle, as we see when he fights against Gajil. This allows for a very free flowing and adaptable style of battle that is very versatile. He can turn the shadows into weapons or he can use them to move around swiftly in a fight. His shadow dragon's roar allows him to shoot a blast of shadows at his target and he can even enter into his own shadow which makes it super hard to battle against him and it makes him a crafty baka when it comes to stealth and info gathering. As a third generation dragon slayer he can also use dragon force at will and he gets a massive buff in his power when he does so. His skin becomes more like that of the shadow dragons and he has the aura of shadows that are flaming around his body. When talking about Rogue, you can't really avoid talking about Sting, which is going to be our next dragon slayer and the final dragon slayer of the third generation. So Sting, like Rogue, was sent 400 years into the future to assist in taking out Agnologia, but whereas Rogue was obsessed with Gajil, Sting has a very strong attachment to Natsu. He is also the current guild master of Sabretooth and he uses white dragon slayer magic. Sting, he can be a bit cocky at times even carefree and easy 
going at other times. It is very rare that we see him lose his temper and his guild master, he is very sensitive. Unlike Rogue, who we saw early on was disturbed by his former guild master's decision to punish a teammate for losing, Sting, he showed zero impact from what he was seeing. Instead, he doubled down on the perception that might makes right. Because as the strongest guild, it was expected of them to only have strong members at the time. However, again, as the series progresses, we see him change and move away from that smug, arrogant prick who we first meet. And as guild master, he's begun to change the culture of Sabretooth. He wears his heart on his sleeve. So you know exactly where you stand with him and exactly how he's feeling, which is why we'll see Rogue calling him Master Crybaby when he does decide to tease him. As guild master, he takes the pride of his guild and he takes the defeat of his guildmates against the Alvarez Empire absolutely to heart. He's a very caring individual. We see him openly sobbing and blaming himself for their loss. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. When he's using white dragon slayer magic, he can generate light from every part of his body on a whim. His white dragon's roar allows him to shoot out a laser like roar that packs a really nasty punch, as does his white dragon's holy breath, which unleashes an even more powerful blast that can leave behind more widespread damage in its wake. When using white drive, he can amp up his magic abilities as well as his speed and strength, most notably his speed. He, like Rogue, can enter into Dragon Force at will, being cloaked in a aura light, and he gets an insane boost in power as a result. He can also use white shadow dragon mode, which comes from eating remnants of Rogue's shadow dragon slayer magic. This allows him to use white dragon slayer magic and combine it with the shadows and use Dragon Force on top of that. Now we move on to the fourth generation of dragon slayers, and that's the Quantum Army, which we first meet in the events of the fairy tale movie Dragon Cry. They were created by Zash as an army of autonomous artificial soldiers. While they do possess great power, as we see in Fairy Tale Dragon Cry and in episode 2 of 100 Year Quest, they aren't too much to be concerned with. There isn't a ton of information to really go over with them, so we'll move away from them. And so we'll close out with the fifth generation of Dragon Slayers, who are, to say the least, very overpowered, as you should be seeing as you watch Fairy Tale 100 Year Quest's anime. So, so up first, we have Kyria, and this baddie is a member of the Diabolos gang, famous for eating dragons. She uses Blade Dragon Slayer magic, which naturally makes her a perfect enemy to battle Urza for reasons more than just her being equipped with a sword to battle, which by the time you guys are seeing this, you should know exactly what I mean by this. She's battle crazed, she is sexy, and she is very cocky. She gets a thrill off of battle and isn't above throwing shaded people as she's fighting them. She gets off on hunting down and devouring dragons to take their abilities, and this lends itself to showing she has a bit of a sadistic side to her, allowing herself to be captured in the hopes of battling the water dragon god. And she is perceptible enough to know that she was battling a fake dragon god on top of that. Her blade dragon slayer magic allows her to conjure and manipulate blades. Her blade dragon's roar slices everything in her path. She can literally cut away at the fighting spirit of her enemy like we dragon slayer. She doesn't have motion sickness. While she can use dragon force as we'll see in a moment there's a reason why fifth generation dragon slayers don't use dragon force. So Mad Mole is up next and he uses armor dragon slayer magic. He can come across as very polite using appropriate honorifics in Japanese when he speaks to people, but as you expect, he is very calculated in battle. Whereas some of his other guildmates are bloodthirsty, he is really the thinker of the group. His armor dragon slayer magic allows him to become durable enough to endure insane levels of power from attacks regardless as if they're physical attacks like Natsu's fire dragon king attacks or weaponized attacks from things like Urza's blade. His physical might is enough that it can make someone like Natsu have a bit of a time with them, as shown when he throws Natsu into a ship and almost crashes the ship. Skolion Raider uses Corpse Dragon Slayer magic. He too is dead set on taking the powers of dragons and he is super arrogant and for a really good reason. He is incredibly strong. He is the one who calls the shots for quite a few of the interactions that we see with the Diabolus gang and the others. For the most part, they fall in line when they get orders. He is also perceptive, being the one to figure out that the Water Dragon God had lost his powers. His Corpse Dragon Slayer magic makes him formidable. He can teleport himself and others when he's using it. When he uses it on people, he can dissolve their body into ashes and can use it to blind his targets. He can turn fire and water into ash, but his weakness comes from battling someone like Wendy, who uses air for her attacks. He can also make his body intangible by using his magic to avoid damage, and he can make objects by using the ash itself. Next up, we have Ryzen, the former guild master Diabolos. He uses four beast dragon slayer magic. He's very quick to belittle people. He prides himself on the whole might makes right type of mindset. He's demanding of those who are underneath him. He only views those underneath him as being as useful as the dragon.
dragon meat that they bring him. Sadly, we don't get to see him use his dragon slayer magic because Selene takes him out very quickly, if we're being honest here. But as a guild master, he is, as you would expect, someone who's very strong. He just ran into the misfortune of running into someone as strong as Selene. Navarro is up next, and he uses clinging dragon slayer magic. His character is pretty straightforward. He's simple minded. He likes to battle. He loves to hunt those who are weaker than him, regardless as if they're dragons or dragon slayers. If you're lucky enough for him to find you interesting, then he'll just wait to kill you and devour you. It's a subtle sign of how childish he can be. Just as a kid will play with their food, this guy plays with his prey. We see further signs of his childish nature and how he's able to ignore orders when given to him when he's told specifically not to use dragon force, all because he wants to continue his battle, even if it means going into a berserker-like state when he undergoes the rapid dragonization and he loses all sense of himself. Clinging dragon slayer magic allows him to make these super sticky substances which allow him to trap his target, allows him to stick to substances and manipulate substance by making hand gestures. This makes him uniquely set up to battle against someone like Wendy. We move on to Wraith, one of the most interesting of the fifth generation, if not the most interesting due to how his magic works, which is spirit dragon slayer magic. In short, he is a living embodiment of that meme from the 90s where people are saying I see dead people because he is literally dead. Living people for the most part they can't see him and it leads to one of the wackiest battles in 100 year quest that I won't go into details with with the fight in order to avoid spoilers but this is highly enjoyable. It's gonna be a highlight for season one of this anime. His spirit dragon slayer magic allows him to not be seen or heard by anyone who isn't a dragon or a dragon slayer. He can use souls of the dead as a means to attack someone. Due to him being unseen by people he cannot be physically attacked unless there is a specific circumstance set up which again I won't go into because of spoilers but it's got some wacky elements that you know and love from fairy tale involved in it there's some comedy in it he can also make soul dragon mouth in order to trap his targets he can possess the bodies of people under the right circumstances so as to avoid spoilers we're going to move on from Rafe but you will thank me when you see both the wacky nature of the fight as well as the emotional reveal that is sure to make some of you guys shed some manly tears Years. Next up, we have Suzaku, who uses Sword Saint Dragon Slayer magic. He's loyal to a fault, and he speaks in that old-timey type of dialect, and he is super respectful as a result. His magic allows him to slash objects with a dark aura that rips whatever's in his path to shreds. He can make pressure around him that moves in a cyclone of sorts when it comes to slashes. Basically, if you made Urza into a Dragon Slayer, this would be Urza as a Dragon Slayer. Creative in combat when it comes to using a sword, and incredibly strong. He is a prod wielding a sword. He is super overpowered, enough so that he gives Urza trouble and holds the upper hand against them when they fight. Now, Kieran is our next Dragon Slayer who uses yellow Dragon Slayer magic. He can be a bit of a jokester at times, and he has one of the cooler designs for the fifth generation members, if we're being honest. He takes pride in his power and is willing to support Selene when it comes to her reaching her goal. When he was a youth, he devoured the Lightning Dragon King, but when the dragon's heart was sold and made into Dragon Lacrima, it it resulted in him being haunted by the Lightning Dragon King. His power levels are not to be understated at all, with someone as strong as Loxus directly scaling him to be a rival to Guild Arts and Power, and that lines up because the guy in the fight with Loxus is tanking attacks from his red lightning attacks like they're absolutely nothing. Yellow Dragon Slayer magic allows him to compress and distort the atmosphere with this magic and use lightning. His attacks move so fast that they basically come off as being invisible. Haku is the next Dragon Slayer on our list and being as young as he is, he is childish and he gets excited super easy. Due to him being a child, it makes his power very interesting because it allows him to turn people into dolls and he apologizes to them before he starts inflicting damage onto them. His Dragon Slayer magic is sewing Dragon Slayer magic and he's a very big simp for Wendy and a one-sided affection on his part and he's so much of a simp for that he willingly takes her breath attack when she uses it. His magic allows him to transform people and monsters into dolls that are still capable of moving and speaking and using their magic. He can produce a yarn that isn't able to be cut and he can use it to restrain people. Finally, we have Misaki who uses Azure Dragon Slayer magic for her power. She's sarcastic, but as you expect from someone who used sarcasm, which is stated to be the language of the intelligent, she is very witty, but she also is able to figure out the strength and weaknesses very quickly and she is insanely protective of those who she cares for. Her magic allows her to manipulate the space in a very similar way way to spatial magic. She can manipulate and control objects. She can send invisible blasts at her targets and tear them apart. She can make spatial constructs and 
dish out damage. She can summon weapons in a manner that is comparable to hers as Requip Magic. She can transport herself and others to her own pocket dimension. She has had her power level directly scaled as being between Loxus and Guildart, which makes her extremely powerful and nothing to take for granted. While that's going to be it for all 22 Dragon Slayers in Fairy Tale from all five generations, if you enjoyed this fairy tale video, consider watching the one over here on the left and over here on the right. We got another video from Anime Explained, and as we get more fairy tale content for 100 Year Quest, we'll update the link on the right for you.